delighted to be able to speak to you all today. Um, just a thumbs up that you can, first of all, hear me and B, see my slides. We can, Tom. Great, Laurie. Yeah, it's always good to know the technology is working. So, um, so I'm Tom Hill. I'm one of the academics in Newcastle University. Um, I'm also involved in um, a funded initiative between Liverpool, Sheffield and ourselves at Newcastle, which is based on trying to understand how diet, lifestyle and other factors influence the musculoskeletal system. The body is called SEMA, the Centre for Integrated Musculoskeletal Aging. And SEMA is very keen to engage with the public um, around promoting um, you know, the diet and the lifestyle factors which we know can influence our musculoskeletal system. And just a little bit of trivia for you all, um, musculoskeletal problems are the number one cause uh, of morbidity in people right across the life course. Um, and it costs a lot of money to treat uh, musculoskeletal problems such as pain, falls and fractures. So it's really important that we can develop strategies to reduce the burden of these conditions. So today I'm going to focus specifically on our bones and I'm going to talk specifically about food for our bones. So I've tried to pitch it at a fairly basic level. I've got a, a tiny little bit of technical jargon, but I've tried to keep it uh, to a minimum. So I'll begin by talking a little bit about our skeletal system. And you'll all be familiar with this, which is our skeleton. Our bones are made of several tissues. They are primarily composed of collagen and hydroxyapatite. And there are about 206 bones in the adult human body. And a quick question for you all. Um, does the cow have more or less bones than a human? More or less, anybody want to guess? More. More? Who said more? That was me, Tom. Laura, as I guess. Well, Laura, you're absolutely right. One more, 207 bones uh, in, a, in a cow. So just one bone more than an adult human. So our bones and our, uh, are, are composed of minerals, like I've said. And the major minerals that are found in our bones are calcium and phosphorus. If you look at the percentage of our bodies that's made up of calcium, it's about one and a half to two percent of our entire body weight is made up of just that single nutrient. And importantly, 99% of that calcium is located in our skeleton. So therefore, close enough to one and a half percent of our body weight is the calcium in our bones. So a remarkable amount of mineral. We also have phosphorus and a number of other minerals to a lesser extent. So calcium is by far the most important mineral in our bones. So without doubt, I'm sure we all know that the major functions of the skeleton are to provide mechanical support and protection for the internal organs. A good example of that is our skull because it protects the brain. Our rib cage uh, protects our heart and our uh, internal organs and the thoracic cavity. But often we forget that bones have very important uh, functions outside of the skeleton. And these functions include um, regulation of minerals. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, where our bones act as a reservoir for calcium between the blood and the bone. So we can move calcium and minerals uh, in and out of the bone, which is really important for metabolic health. It helps to uh, maintain acid-base homeostasis, which is important for maintaining vital bodily functions. It also provides defense against toxins such as lead. And importantly, it also uh, produces red blood cells. So these are the cells that are involved in transporting oxygen around the body, which allow us to generate energy. And the sternum or the breastbone is the most um, you know, important site of the production of these red blood cells. And bone is composed of 60% uh, inorganic material, which is ultimately the minerals, but it's also got some organic um, material, which is basically calcium, hydrogen and oxygen. And it's also got a little bit of water. So I know this might be a, a rather complicated diagram, but what I want to illustrate here 
is that bone is composed of two different types. We have the uh, hard bone uh, or the uh, compact bone, which is the circle around the bone. And that's exactly that. It's hard, it's compact, it's very rigid. And it provides that really important metabolic, uh, sorry, uh, rigidity and, and structural support. Bone also contains um, soft bone, sometimes called spongy bone. So that's what you see um, in the middle uh, diagram there. You see what looks like a porous bone, that spongy bone. Now, don't be fooled because bone is very strong. And importantly, bone is highly metabolically active. You can see here that there are blood vessels supplying oxygen to the bone. So in effect, bone is not a dull inert tissue. It's very highly metabolically active and it's the spongy bone which has most of that metabolic activity. So in terms of our bones and, you know, if you like our bones developing and growing over our lifetime, we have two processes which are important. We have bone resorption, um, which is basically governed by the osteoclasts. So these are the bone cells which degrade old bone. And then we have the osteoblasts, which are the bone forming cells. So these are involved in the building up of bone. So it's a bit like a construction where you have building up uh, and breaking back down. And this is a normal healthy process. Um, just like our skin, just like our nails, just like our hair, just like our muscles, our bones need to be continuously um, broken down and built back up. So we need to degrade old bone and replace it with new healthy uh, bone as well. So it's a normal process. And the balance of this process ultimately, ultimately determines our bone mineral density. And I want to make this point about the hormonal regulation of bone, because we know that there are many hormones that are involved in bone metabolism. So like I said earlier, um, bone can basically move calcium from the, the center of that bone through the bloodstream, because our calcium level, which is the middle of that uh, diagram there, so the bit in gray that goes up, that connects the, the two parts of the diagram, we must maintain our blood calcium levels within very strict limits um, to maintain key physiological uh, functions. And the mineral in our bone allows us to do that. So if our blood calcium levels are low, um, then the mineral in the bone can be used to, if you like, buffer the blood calcium level. And the hormones involved are uh, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, and they work in synergy to regulate uh, bone turnover. So the take home message from this bit is that bone is very highly metabolically active. Now we know that our bones develop at various rates throughout the life course. So without a shadow of a doubt, the pubertal years, so between about 11, 12 and 15 or 16, is the phase of life where our bones are growing the most. Um, there's a lot of mineral being deposited in bone. So in effect, what's happening here in this phase is there's a huge net gain in the amount of bone mineral that's laid down. And then as you progress throughout, you know, late teens and young adulthood, you still get a net gain in bone uh, death deposition and bone mass. And there comes a point which you will reach your peak bone mass, which is the heaviest in weight that your bones will be. And that's typically around 30 years of age. And then sadly, unfortunately, you start to lose a bone gradually over the course of your lifetime. Um, and in women, it's exacerbated by the menopause. So the menopause is that phase in a woman's life um, where you get estrogen deficiency, which increases the risk of bone loss and ultimately then osteoporosis. And osteoporosis is that bone disease, one of the main bone diseases, which is in effect um, a condition of fragility. The bones lose uh, minerals, lose calcium and phosphorus over the course of uh, somebody's lifetime. And it also leads to that microarchitectural deterioration of the mineral within the bone. Now, treating osteoporotic related fractures costs the NHS a lot of money every year. And it's well known that there are many factors which can influence osteoporosis risk. So what you see on the slide is a, an example of those factors, right? So there's certainly aging. As you age, your risk goes up. The menopause also places women at increased risk 
a number of sporadic and diseases also increase the risk, um, you know, such as inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis. These conditions uh, are known to increase the risk of osteoporosis. But if we look at the top left-hand box, we see nutritional factors and lifestyle. And it's known that these can influence uh, about, the 20, about 25 percent of the variation in our bones. The other 75 percent is genetically inherited. So the bottom line in this is that there is scope to influence our uh, bones through our diet and our lifestyle. And the key factors which have been identified in promoting optimal bone health are, and I have to be honest, in order of importance, exercise. That is by far more important than any dietary uh, factor on its own in promoting optimal bone health. And it's in particular exercise that involve, you know, moving against gravity. So, you know, running, walking, uh, jogging, hopping, skipping, jumping, uh, any activities that involve, um, you know, going against gr the gravitational force. And there are three key nutrients, ones that we know there's very strong evidence for a role in bone health. And these are protein, uh, which I'm sure you'll all have heard of, calcium, and the sunshine vitamin, vitamin D. And I'll talk a bit about these for the remainder of the session. Now, before I do, I also want to uh, provide you with a list of other uh, dietary factors where there is known evidence for some link to bone health. So the evidence for much of these will not be as strong as for protein, calcium, and vitamin D. Um, but nonetheless, they are still very, very important. And you can see on the left, some of the beneficial factors, um, some of the minerals like copper and zinc, phosphorus, magnesium, even vitamin C through collagen um, and its function in collagen can um, you know, impact bone positively. Fruit and vegetables, they contain um, you know, many different bioactives and antioxidants, which may protect against uh, bone loss as well over time. But there are also detrimental factors. So, you know, consuming too much of these is known to um, impact bone health. So too much alcohol, too much caffeine, too much sodium, fluoride and excess uh, protein intake. We know very high protein intakes uh, can have the uh, opposite effect um, to promoting calcium leaching from the bones. So it's important that we um, are mindful of all the factors, both the ones that are beneficial and uh, detrimental. So I want to have a note about exercise because this is really important. A lot of the early evidence for a role of exercise in bone comes from, believe it or not, astronauts. You know, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, astronauts were, you know, it was that space age, especially with the Americans and the Russians leading the way and going on space flight. And uh, unfortunately, a number of astronauts were coming back after space missions and um, losing a lot of their bone mass. And this was because of the lack of the gravitational force on the skeleton. And it's remarkable, really, when you think about it, that, you know, an astronaut can lose um, the same amount of bone as a postmenopausal woman in one year after a single space flight. Now, there's no need to worry nowadays because astronauts do have um, specific training programs um, to, you know, mitigate against the lack of gravity. Uh, in space flight, and they are very closely monitored as well uh, for their diet in, in trying to maintain their bone health uh, as much as possible. And to summarize the evidence on exercise um, from the American College of Sports Medicine, um, it's clear that early and sustained effects of exercise on bone. So this is very much now in early life. So, you know, from about 10, 11 years on, that critical window of opportunity in terms of bone growth and development. Um, it depends on the intensity of the exercise and the maturity level of the child. It's also known that due to differences in skeletal maturity, um, specific interventions might be started at a younger age in girls than boys. So the evidence suggests that, you know, the, the, the importance of exercise and diet, it seems to be you know, more important a little bit earlier in girls than boys. So between about nine and 10 for girls and maybe a little bit 11 and 12 uh, for boys. And the American College of Sports Medicine recommend activities which generate high ground reaction forces. So a little bit like the diagram I had earlier, which involves uh, jumping, skipping uh, and running, running and all done in a very safe uh, environment as well. 
So I want to talk a bit about the nutrients next, and I'll focus firstly on calcium. I'm sure you'll have heard of calcium. You'll even know that there are important food sources, and I've given you some of those in my, um, in my slide, both plant and animal sources as well. But before I talk a bit about this in more detail, um, I want to maybe let you know about some of the non-skeletal actions of calcium. So this comes back to the importance of calcium in regulating a range of uh, body functions, including transmitting nerves, muscle contraction, uh, regulating our heartbeat, um, you know, form, forming blood clots and allowing our bloods to clot, uh, being a, a cofactor in blood clotting. Uh, and as a result, our blood calcium must be maintained within tight limits. And that's why if that deviates, if the blood level of calcium goes up or down, um, the bones then can use the calcium to mitigate that effect. So they play a really important metabolic role, um, even though I know they don't look like they do. So the requirements for calcium um, for teenagers, so, you know, for 18 to 11, so 80, sorry, 11 to 18 year olds rather, um, is slightly higher in males than females. It's about 1000 milligrams for males and 800 milligrams uh, for females. And just to put that in perspective, uh, a 200 milliliter glass of uh, regular milk, be it low fat or full fat milk, uh, will give about 240 milligrams of calcium. So about a third of uh, a female's requirement and about a quarter of a male's requirement. And what I've also done here is put up the calcium content of a range of foods, you know, including the dairy foods. Um, and without a doubt, cheddar cheese is by far the best dietary source. It's got a whopping 670 milligrams uh, per 100 grams, so a lot of calcium in hard cheese. Um, but also plant sources can be important. Uh, tofu is a good source of calcium. Um, and plant foods, although they are highly variable, they can be uh, a valuable source as well. And just to give you a little bit more information on the, the plant-based sources and the fortified sources, many drinks now, that um, are, are attempting to try and replace milk. So there's a lot of these milks that are available that are not cow's milk, but more plant-based milks um, that are on sale, which also contain calcium. And these can be valuable sources for, particularly for people who are on uh, vegetarian diets, vegan diets, uh, or people who avoid dairy for various reasons. Um, and you know, as a nutritionist, I, I think it's really important as well that we mix up our diet, that we do include plant-based sources as much as animal-based sources for um, all nutrients, not just uh, calcium. So on the slide, you can see that the milk is about 240, um, but for example, um, a fortified milk drink will have roughly the same. And briefly, just to talk a little bit about calcium supplements, do you need calcium supplements? The simple answer to that is no, if your calcium intake is good. So if you're eating a balanced diet with you know, good amounts of uh, calcium foods, be a plant or animal, and you're meeting your requirement, you don't need extra calcium supplements. However, calcium supplements might be useful in certain conditions uh, for people who are you know, maybe on reduced appetites, um, you know, who don't eat specific foods, and, and maybe who are at an increased risk. And the effect of supplementation of calcium on bone um, has shown beneficial effects, but again, only in people with low baseline calcium intakes. Um, there's no rationale of taking additional calcium for your bones over and above your normal intakes if you're meeting the rec recommendations. And there's also evidence to show that um, the benefits are dependent on the site of your bone mass. So whether it's the, the trunk bone or the appendicular bone, which is the arms uh, and the legs. And interestingly, there's also some research suggesting that um, dairy foods, not just calcium, but dairy might have additional benefits. And that is linked to some of the other nutrients that's found in dairy, not just the calcium. So we know dairy has got protein in it. It's also got a number of other potential ingredients that may have a synergistic effect on our bones. Um, so we really need to think about, you know, our bones in terms of foods and not just single nutrients really. Now, the next one I want to talk about is the sunshine vitamin, vitamin D which is made in our skin upon exposure to sunlight. Unfortunately, in the UK for six months of the year, so right now in the middle of December, uh, we are not able to make vitamin D in our skin, even if we're outside, um, because the sun is too low in the sky. 
um, we can only make it typically between April and September, so during the late spring um, and summertime. And we know vitamin D is involved in the regulation of calcium balance. It helps to absorb calcium uh, from the intestines. And in the UK, we find people with low vitamin D levels in wintertime. Sorry, my, my circles are a little bit off. They should be a little bit to the left. Uh, so that's indicated in the, in the red uh, circles and vitamin D tends to be highest in the summertime. So low in winter, uh, high in summer. And for that reason, the importance of diet becomes really important to make up for the lack of vitamin D from the sun. And one of the consequences of vitamin D deficiency is a bone disease called rickets, which is called the Victorian disease because it was very prevalent in Victorian England uh, about 150 years ago. And uh, pick this bit of trivia out that in Cornish folklore, if a child is passed nine times through the hole in the stone, um, against the sun, it's got to be against the sun, then uh, it will be cured of rickets. So a little bit of trivia there uh, in relation to um, rickets. But rickets, in effect, is a, a failure uh, of mineralization of the cartilaginous growth plate. So there's a lack of calcium and, and phosphorus deposition, basically, in the growth plates of the, the bones. And that basically means that the growth plate becomes irregular and wide, and it's clinically known as rickets. And you see either the bowed legs or the squished in legs and that's basically the classic um, you know phenotypic sign of uh, rickets. Now preventing rickets involves supplementation um, and also diet as well and when you look at the requirement 10 micrograms per day you'd need to eat about six egg yolks to meet that requirement or an average portion of salmon but we all know that in the UK we don't really as a population eat much oily fish so we tend to rely on other sources, including fortified foods. And one of the best sources can be fortified cereal. So if you do consume cereal, make sure that it's fortified with vitamin D. So there are, as you can see, various sources of uh, vitamin D on, on the slide. Now, I'm almost finished. Um, you'll be glad to hear, but I, I want to wrap up with protein uh, because protein has been synonymous with bone uh, for years. Protein is essential for the normal growth and development of bones. And we also must pay attention to ensuring that we mix our protein sources. So we must also encourage non-animal sources of protein as well. Great examples would be beans, peas, you know, staples in the, the UK diet. You know, good advice would be to try and mix up our uh, plant-based proteins as well over the course of the week. Try having one or two meat-free days uh, as well and have some of these foods as your main meal. Um, and in the end, I've given you some um, typical compositions of various uh, foods, plant-based sources of protein as well. Now, the requirements for protein are expressed per kilogram of body weight, and it's typically um, about 0.8 grams per kilogram. So if you're a 70 kilo person, your protein requirements are about 55 grams per day. So it's not that difficult to meet your protein requirements. So it's important that you mix up your diet with a combination of uh, plant and animal sources uh, in that regard. Okay, so to wrap up, and I have to say I've done that, I've, I've tried to give you a very quick whistle-stop tour of, of diet and bones, but to, to wrap up, the checklist is basically ensure your protein is good, ensure your calcium and vitamin D intake is good. There's nothing wrong with taking a vitamin D supplement uh, at 10 micrograms per day. In fact, the government do recommend that, uh, but you certainly don't need calcium or protein supplements. Uh, these are best obtained from food sources where possible. Um, get regular exercise, very important, but also don't forget other nutrients too. Think about the good diet for bones being good foods and a mix of foods uh, for your bones, and don't just limit it to uh, one or two foods. And the final point linked to that is make sure that you have a balanced diet containing all the essential uh, nutrients because just like for other uh, beneficial effects on health it's also vital for your bone health as well